A Hazardous Hospital Love It was my first day at Parkway Hospital as a doctor of medicine. The last time I was here, I was merely an intern who did not know if I could even survive medical school, and today, I received my coat bearing the name Ariz Elliott, MD. I patiently waited for my assigned supervisor for the week. I chose to pursue the surgical program at Parkway Hospital, and my folks thought that I was mad for picking such a hardcore and difficult specialty, but I was headstrong on becoming a surgeon. Besides, Parkway had one of the best surgical programs and I was pumped to learn from seasoned surgeons. From the corner of my eye, I spotted a well-built man with disheveled hair and bright blue eyes. He had Playboy, Trouble, and Naughty written all over him. He was one of those people who you would want to do a double take at if you saw them walking down the streets. I tried to unpeel my eyes from him, at least he found me creepy on the first day here, but he must have noticed my intense stare because he also eyed me curiously only breaking away from my stare to wink at a nurse passing by. Flirt. Mark Aris, head of pediatric surgery, and I'm here for my trainee of the week. Is that you? He asked. His voice was sultry and deep, the kind that could normally lull me to sleep. It did not help that the man looked sexy. No, stop it, Ariz. He's your boss. This is not right. Dr. Ariz Elliott, and yes, I'm here for your service, I replied as professionally as I possibly could. I had to muster every ounce of courage so that my voice would not crack, and he would not notice that I was beginning to sweat. I had only been in his presence for a few minutes and my body was already reacting in ways I definitely did not want it to, especially during my first day on duty as a doctor. Well, Elliot, you're in for a roller coaster here at pediatric surgery, warned Harris. Follow me. We ended up doing rounds, visiting his pre-operation and post-operation patients, and monitoring their statuses. I mainly did charting, writing updates about the patient and basically tailing Harris wherever he went. Very quickly, I realized that this man was just as charming as I initially thought. He seemed to be on good graces of the children he operated on or will be operating on. Unlike his intimidating and muscular facade, he was extremely gentle with the kids, as a pediatrician normally would be. But he was also undeniably a flirt. As I was following him toward another patient's room, we passed by a ton of nurses and a couple of other doctors. He would wink at them, blurt a cheesy pickup line, or even a simple hey would solicit a giggle or two from the lingering nurses. Very quickly, I started to hate his guts, and I swear it was not because I felt some sort of attraction toward him. It was purely because he was not behaving professionally. Especially seeing as he was already a seasoned doctor, compared to me, and we could not be further apart in terms of personality. He was flirty, charming, and as much as I hated to admit it, downright attractive. This was not right. It was only my first day and I was already attracted to my supervisor. I was here to learn. I was here to be a great doctor. I was certainly not here to ignite a hospital love. That would be a distraction. That would make me unprofessional. A hospital love had hazardous written all over it and I had to stay far, far away from it. But temptation had other plans for me. During lunch break, I thought I could finally get these intriguing, tempting thoughts about Dr. Mark Harris out of my head, but it seemed like my fellow newbie doctors had other plans. Did you see Dr. Harris? I heard he's hung, giggled Sadie, one of the new doctors who quickly became a friend of mine. Oh, he's hot all right. Ariz here had the pleasure of working with him, teased another fellow doctor, Jasmine, emphasizing the word pleasure which made the entire table of newly hired doctors laugh. He's fine, a little unprofessional if you ask me. Flirting here and there, he seems to be enchanting the nurses and even some of the doctors with that smile, I ranted. Sadie raised her eyebrow curiously. Do you happen to be one of the doctors that he has enchanted, Ariz? Sadie poked. I rolled my eyes, disregarding her teasing. I like Sadie. She was a good character and a smart doctor, but she did have a playful side. Just as I was finally digging into my lunch, the talk of the hour walked into the cafeteria. Or strutted in is more like it. He had that swagger that made everyone stop and stare for a split second. He demanded attention. Speak of the devil, whispered Jasmine. He is hot, isn't he? He sure is, said Sadie breathily. Try as I might to keep my focus solely on the sandwich I was eating, I could not help but look up and steal a look at Dr. Harris. It was a bad idea though, as his striking blue eyes met mine at that very moment. I could only hold his intense gaze for a few seconds before I forced myself to look away. I was positive that I was flustered, so I forced myself to down my sandwich and avoid further eye contact with Dr. Harris at all costs. That was until he literally passed by our table and greeted me. Hey, Dr. Elliot, I'll see you after lunch, he said casually with a slight wink which made Sadie and Jasmine's eyes widen. You, less than a day in Harris's service and you're already flirting with him? Come on, give us girlies a chance, hollered Sadie. 
Jasmine laughed and I could only roll my eyes playfully at my teasing friends. I didn't even know Ariz liked boys. I don't, I retorted. Sure, Ariz, sure, replied Sadie sarcastically as we all wrapped up our lunch and headed back to work. Throughout the day, I tried to ignore Dr. Harris's advances toward me, but it was just too difficult to ignore a man of his magnitude. Wherever he was, he seemed to be commanding attention. The kids he was treating loved him because he always had a joke or a trick up his sleeve. Their parents trusted him because of the reassurance he provided them, for his quick-witted and strategic thinking leading to swift and accurate diagnosis. As much as I despised his guts and flirty personality, it was undeniable that Dr. Mark Harris was extremely smart and competent. I surely had a lot to learn from him. The end of our shift was fast approaching, and I sat at the nurse's station to update some patients' charts. Dr. Harris disappeared for a couple of minutes, only to return with two cups of scorching coffee from the hospital cafeteria and a pastry. For our new doc, he offered as he gave me one of the coffee cups and the bread. I raised my eyebrow curiously, but accepted the goods. Thank you, Dr. Harris, I replied. Mark, he replied. Call me Mark. Mark, I repeated, which made him break out into a seductive sexy smirk that everyone in the hospital seemed to be crazy about. How was your first day? Learned a lot? He questioned before sipping a cup of his coffee. Sure, I would have learned more if you weren't flirting with every human that we encountered, I replied before I could stop myself. See, that was the thing about me. I was straightforward and I could not help it. I quickly apologized, realizing that it was my superior that I was talking to. I'm sorry. It's all good, Elliot. First day and I know you haven't met a doctor quite as charming as I am, he replied with a wink. Are you always this flirty? Literally with everyone? Boy, girl, young, old? Depends, said Harris. I'm fun, you know? Fun, smart, charming, all that. Traits you don't always find in one doctor. And a narcissist, I snapped back. This incited a laugh from Harris, exposing his perfectly white and straight teeth which I admittedly found attractive. You say it's narcissism, I say it's confidence, he retorted. I tell you what, you bear with my charm and I'll teach you a lot about surgery. I could be a good teacher, you know. Beyond this whole facade of mine, I'm a great doctor and an even better surgeon, a wonderful teacher. I was about to retort back, but I knew that he was actually good at his job, and as a newly hired doctor, I was desperate for some experience and new learning, the kind of knowledge that only seasoned doctors like Dr. Harris could impart to me. Deal. True to his words, Mark was indeed a wonderful teacher. As the days go by, I felt more at ease at his service. I was getting used to the flirtatious remarks that seemed to come out of his mouth, like word vomit. But I was getting even more used to his sharpness and agility as a doctor, which all his patients seemed to appreciate. I hated to admit it, but he was a doctor and a damn good one at that. Coffee? He offered during one of our afternoon shifts. I cracked a smile at him, appreciating the gesture, although he was very much consistent at doing this. Thanks, Mark, I said. Taking the coffee cup from his hand, our hands brushed in the process and I looked up instinctively, only to find his blue eyes already on me. That's the first time you flash me a smile, he observed. It's a great smile. I rolled my eyes and took a sip of the cappuccino. It's not true. I always smile. At patients, especially kids, yes, I've observed it, Mark replied. But at me, never. You always seem to have a frown when you're looking at me, but today, I got a real smile from you. Only got charmed by Dr. Harris, he winked. You wish, I said, although his observation made me crack a weak smile once again. Oh, Dr. Elliot, I think you like me more than you care to admit, teased Mark, before finally walking away. Oh boy, I think he was right. As days passed, the coffee kept coming. He was consistently bringing me a pick-me-up that powered me through our long shifts. We were also beginning to build an oddly comforting camaraderie in between rounds. We could talk about our interests and I finally saw a side of Dr. Mark Harris that I could never have deduced just by looking at his flirty exterior. I found out that he was quite the Harry Potter geek and he shipped Harry with Draco. I did not peg him to like boy-on-boy -boy romances, but he was head over heels in love with them he also baked, which surprised me. He was a dynamic character and it was beginning to scare me just how much I was enjoying his company. As promised, my famous cinnamon roll is just for you, he announced one time before we did our rounds and checked our patient. You made these? I asked, surprised by the large fluffy pastries he placed in front of me. You said you didn't believe me when I told you I made some bomb rolls, so here you are, he shrugged. I eyed the rolls curiously and raised my eyebrow at him. 
I was touched by the gesture, especially since he really seemed to care about what I thought. Have a bite. Let me know what you think. I'll get back to you in a few minutes. I just have to see the sheaf, Mark said before walking away. The moment he was out of sight, I felt a slap on my shoulder. No way, Dr. Mark Harris made you cinnamon rolls, Aries? Cinnamon rolls? Jasmine said in utter shock. I shrugged, having a bite of the pastries. So good, I complimented. What the hell's on with you two? Don't tell me you're sleeping with each other, Sadie suggested. I glanced at my two friends in disbelief. No way, I'm just at a service, that's it, nothing else. You sure? Because it doesn't seem like it. He brings you coffee every day, Aries, replied Jasmine. He probably does it to all the new doctors who help him. I'm at a service, remember? I dismissed. No way that he does that to everyone, Aries. We have heard nurses talk about Mark Harris. He may be flirty and charming and all that, but he doesn't make effort. Ever, Sadie argued. He must really like you. I shook my head vigorously. He can't, I asserted. He can't like me. He's an experienced senior doctor and I'm just starting. It's like a teacher-student thing. It can't. He can't. I can't. We can't. It was only after I walked away from a very confused Sadie and an unconvinced Jasmine that I realized how my defensiveness probably backfired on me. You never told me how those rolls tasted, Mark suddenly appeared out of nowhere. It has been a few days since he brought me his baked goods and since Sadie and Jasmine convinced me that my supervisor had a thing for me. Since then, I kept my interactions with him to a minimum. I even skimped out on the coffee he was bringing me. Basically, I was avoiding him at all costs. I could not afford a distraction at work. Not when I was just starting out. Not when I was literally a nobody here. I was building a name for myself and I was not going to let a flirty, inappropriate older doctor throw me off my game. Eh, I replied. I felt a pair of strong hands lift up my chin at that very moment. I was pretending to read a medical journal when Mark walked into the locker room. You're avoiding me, Elliot, he asked wearily. I haven't seen you much lately. I rolled my eyes, a habit I seem to be having since my first day at Parkway. I'm not, I denied, shrugging off his hands and trying my best to pretend that his mere presence was not making me hot and bothered. I'm busy. Busy? What could you be busy with? You're in my service, at PEDS, Mark replied. Friends and work and other things you couldn't possibly know about since you're busy with your patients and flirting with every pair of titties you can see in the hallway. I shouted before I could help myself. Really? Because as far as I can recall, titties aren't the only thing I flirt with. What? I asked astonished. You, he said nonchalantly, as he coolly sat beside me. Why else would I bring you baked goods, silly? You think i do that for every new doctor that comes at my service? I started breathing heavily at this point, so Sadie and Jasmine were right. Dr. Mark Harris was trying to get with me. My heart started beating heavily in my chest and I dared not spare a glance at Mark, and so I ran. I have to go, I said weakly. Really, Aries, you're avoiding me after I just confessed to you? I flee and slammed the door on my way out, leaving Mark Harris hanging. Over the course of the next few days, I successfully avoided Mark. Thank goodness. They needed another doctor at Cardiothoracic, so I got off Mark's service. I spent most of the time with Jasmine, who was also assigned to Cardio, although I saw Mark a few times. They were only for a split second, until I'm either running in the opposite directions, or directing my attention to Jasmine or at times Sadie. What you're doing is not working. I'm still here, Riz, whispered Mark from behind me. Damn, I did not see him coming, and I definitely flinched as soon as I heard his deep voice. I raised my eyebrow and dared to look him in the eye. What exactly am I doing? Mind your own business, Dr. Harris, I said forcefully. Avoiding me, trying to stick with a girl in hopes that you'll drive me away, replied Mark. In fact, the more you push me away, the more relentless I get. I left you macaroons in your locker. He walked away after that, surprising me with his guts and relentlessness. As impressed as I was by his effort, I wanted to stand my ground and try to look as unfazed as I possibly can be. But lunchtime came and he was still persisting. It seemed like this man really knew his effect on me because as soon as he walked into the cafeteria, I attempted to avoid his gaze. But of course, Mark being Mark sat next to me and made his presence known. He even slid a plate of cheesecake, my favorite dessert from the cafeteria. For you, he said softly. Across me, Jasmine and Sadie were also blushing as they gazed at us, but I knew they were trying their best not to make eye contact with Mark. Thankfully, Mark got up and left the table. 
That was when Jasmine and Sadie started bombarding me with questions once more. Are you together? Is he courting you? Why didn't you tell us? Those were just among the many questions they had. Stop. We're not together. And this thing we have? No, wait. We don't have anything. What was that then? And honestly, you two have intense tension, commented Sadie. Look, Jay, I need you to pretend you're my girlfriend, I asked. What? Both Sadie and Jasmine exclaimed. I sighed. I cannot be with a superior, okay? No matter how attractive he is, no matter how smart he is, no matter how seductive he is, I can't, I said breathly. Jasmine looked at me like I was mad, and how do I fit into this? Pretend you're with me, okay? Maybe then he'll leave me alone, I suggested. He seems to really like you, eh? And if someone likes you that much, you can't possibly drive them away so quickly, Jasmine replied. Can I kiss you? I blurted out. What? Jasmine said, aghast. But okay, whatever floats your boat. Sadie looked at us unapprovingly as I hesitantly placed my soft peck on Jasmine's lips, making sure to look straight at Mark after I did it. He was watching my every move. There, he saw it. Done. Did you call that a kiss? Asked Mark a few hours later as he cornered me before our final rounds for this shift. I tried to escape from him, not wanting to be in his presence any longer. Whenever he was around, I just wanted to stop fighting my feelings at once and just kiss him square in the lips. How's that any of your business, Dr. Harris? I said, emphasizing the word doctor so he would know that I was trying to be professional. Now I'm Dr. Harris? Huh. A few days ago, I was Mark. You were scared, weren't you? He confronted. You realized that I was catching feelings and you were scared. You don't want to be with me. You just want the idea of me. You like the thrill. You like the thought of having someone who doesn't want you, I shouted. That's really what you think of me? Mark questioned. You really think I'm nothing more than a horny and, at times, intelligent doctor? That's certainly what you show everyone, I replied. If you truly like me, prove it. And he did prove it. That night, just as I was about to leave, he kissed me. Amidst the hustle and bustle of the nursing station, he kissed me. He proved he liked me. You said prove it, he said playfully, before walking away. I was speechless, not wanting to move from the place where I was rooted until I felt a light shove. What the hell, exclaimed Sadie, unbelieving of what she just witnessed. What did we tell you, said Jasmine with her typically I told you so face. He's head over heels in love with you. The people surrounding us, primarily nurses, were glaring at me. It was just an understatement to say that they were not delighted about what they had just witnessed. After all, Mark used to get around before me. He said it himself. He probably slept with most of them and did not even recall their name. But I chose to believe that there was a chance for us. At first, I was frightened that he was also playing with me. But the kiss said otherwise. From that day on, Mark and I were inseparable. Of course, we tried to keep our professional demeanor during our shift. After all, he was still my superior, and he was supposed to be the one helping me improve as a doctor. But amidst our professional dynamic, we stole kisses in between shifts. He continued bringing me coffee before rounds. We even grabbed an occasional drink together after work. Mark's previous partners did not take this well. Everywhere I went, nurses and some doctors were shooting me dirty glances. I was followed by hushed whispers and dirty gossip. I guess that was a perk of being the one to tame the adventurous, notorious Mark Harris. I knew that sooner or later, jealousy would get the better of some of our colleagues and they would attempt to destroy the building romance between us. And I was right. One afternoon, I received a page asking me to visit an on-call room. I figured it was Mark just wanting to sneak in a smooch before our rounds. But as soon as I opened the room, something was off. Lying on one of the beds was Mark, and atop him, a nurse. It was Jenny Reed, one of the nurses who started rumors about me as soon as Mark and I got together. When I first got to the hospital, Jenny and I were cordial. But the moment she had heard that I was dating Mark, she turned into a nasty bully. So I knew from the get-go this was a trap. The first hurdle that Mark and I had to overcome. I saw Mark's signs of struggle as soon as I opened the door. He was attempting to get Jenny off him and he need not explain to me why a woman, a shirtless woman at that, was trying to ride him. Arise, it's not what you think it is, Mark defended, finally prying Jenny off of him and getting up. I was just trying to sneak in a nap and I woke up and she was here. I know Mark, but you paged me? I questioned. And then it clicked. Jenny paged me. She planned the sabotage and I was not going to let her win. Oh, she paged me. Jenny now was glaring daggers at me. Too bad it won't work, 
We're strong, I said, with so much contempt. I then kissed Mark on the lips, keeping my eyes on Jenny the whole time, until she eventually left the room and slammed the door shut. The next week there was assigned to neurology, and an experienced doctor named Dr. Lewis Hudgens was my superior for the week. I was thrilled, wanting to learn more about the brain and hoping to get some time in the operating room. But the moment I met him, Dr. Hudgens was nothing but downright hostile. When he quizzed me about a patient's craniotomy, and I could not quite get the spot on answer, he embarrassed me right there and then in front of the patient and other doctors assigned to the case. See, Dr. Elliot not finding his words is the perfect example of why you should spend more time reading about your cases and not sleeping with your superiors. I hung my head in shame, disappointed at my own performance. Maybe you should spend more time actually being a doctor than sleeping with a doctor, Dr. Hudgens whispered on his way out. As if his backhanded comments were not enough, Dr. Hudgens also made sure I never saw a single hour in the operating room. He got me running around updating charts like I was a nurse and not a doctor. It was only when I heard from Sadie that Dr. Hudgens once slept with Mark that I realized he was holding a personal grudge against me. To make matters worse, Dr. Hudgens kicked me off the case later that day, citing that I was out of focus and could only bring catastrophe in the operating room, merely because I was a minute late for a patient's appointment. I ranted this to Mark, which turned out to be a bad decision because he got enraged. He's taking it personally. Lewis has always wanted, Mark lingered. A relationship with you? I finished for him. That son of a bitch, he's really taking it out on you. He wants to make this personal? Let's make it personal, he boomed, before storming off. I tried to keep up with him, but he was too fast. I was rushing down the hall when I heard a commotion. When I got there, I only spotted Mark's bloody hand and Dr. Hudgens' broken nose. Mark punched him. He actually punched him. He stood up for me. In the aftermath, I wrapped Mark's sore hand in the on-call room, wanting some peace and quiet for ourselves. Don't do that again, please, I pleaded. You could lose your job. He was saying things about you. He was saying how incompetent you were and how you only ever got into surgeries because you were sleeping with me. Mark retorted, I defended you. I know, baby, and I'm thankful. You believe in me more than I believe in myself, and you don't let anyone step on me. I'm thankful, but take care of yourself, okay? I said before placing a soft peck on his forehead. Thankfully, the ordeal with Dr. Hudgens died down, but it seemed like Mark and I had drama after drama. Shortly after the punching incident, and just as I thought Dr. Hudgens was finally deterred, then came the explicit photos. It was a low blow, especially for a doctor. Mark and I had just clocked in for work, but I immediately noticed the wide-eyed stares and the whispering following us wherever we went. I was accustomed to quite the spectacle, especially since same-sex relationships were not that common in Parkway. But above all, I was the one who finally tamed Mark Harris, the notorious, sexy, and previously womanizing doctor. I was used to the stares, but they had already died down, especially since the whole drama with Dr. Hudgens. Mark made it clear that he would not stand for disrespect towards me, and that he would be willing to fight anyone who hurt me. So the pointing and staring stopped, at least towards me, because now they were after Mark. What is it now? I sighed. Guess we'll have to wait and find out, Mark said, shaking his head. See you at lunch. During rounds, I came across Sadie and Jasmine, who looked at me like I was a poor beaten puppy. I knew immediately that something was up. Jasmine hugged me and she looked like she was going to cry. What's happening? I questioned, craving answers and just wanting to rip the band-aid. Haven't you heard? Sadie asked back, perplexed. About the text? The photos? What photos? I said. Show her S. She'll know soon enough, Jasmine replied. It was then that they showed me text that had been circulating around. Intimate photos of Mark and Lewis from way back. Mark looked relatively young in the photos, just a new doctor starting his career and exploring his boundaries. Oh my god, I exclaimed. Who did this? It's so cruel. It's just ridiculous how far they'll go. Clearly, Dr. Hudgens did this. That Lewis man looks downright bitter and jealous of you and Mark's relationship, Sadie exclaimed. Obviously, Lewis is jealous, but that's not justifiable. He's spreading intimate photos from way back in an attempt to get back at Mark. It's ridiculous, Jasmine reasoned. You have to find Mark. This is crazy, I said. I found him in the young call room, his sanctuary, and place where he could rest, think, and reflect. I'm so sorry, darling. It was in the past. We were young, stupid, he explained. I hugged him and ran my fingers through his hair, feeling so bad for him. You don't deserve this. You didn't want any of this, I said. 
they're just trying to discredit you. They know you're a great doctor with an excellent career, and now, you're having a great romantic life, and they're trying to destroy it. I'll get fired, he said weakly. As soon as the chief doctor finds out about the photos, I'm done. It's unethical. It's just not right for any respectable doctor to have such photos. Mark and I tried our best to get back to work that afternoon, but he was just too distracted to do any real work. It was not until evening that we got Paige to the chief doctor's office. My heart was palpitating, deep in my chest, bracing for the worst possible consequences. Is Mark losing his job? Is the chief done with the shenanigans surrounding our relationship? And maybe he'll just fire us both? Fortunately, it was neither of those. But the chief did warn us of a heads up as the board of directors of Parkway did set an emergency meeting later that night because of the scandal. Look, Mark, we've been through a lot. You're one of the best senior doctors I have here. And I'm not about to lose you over photos you took when you were like 20. That's ridiculous, the chief said, exasperated. And you, Ariz, you're just a young, ambitious doctor. You're starting out, and I didn't want you getting involved in any more scandals, all right? He added. You mean we can't be together anymore? How does that make you any different from all the people out there who are judging us? I asked, enraged. The chief sighed and shook his head profusely. You're misunderstanding me. I'm standing up for you, young man. I'm the chief doctor, not some fairy godmother. I support you two wherever you may be happy. What I don't support is this nonsense. The scandal, the punching, the fighting, it's unacceptable to make such a hostile environment. You just want to work, right? Mark and I nodded. So you're saying you support us? As your friend, yes. I want both of you to be happy. I will talk to the rest of the staff and they will leave you alone. Chief, thank you, I whispered. Grateful for his support and for this authority figure who is standing up for us. Don't thank me, the chief replied. I have a lesbian daughter, third year med, in Harvard. And God knows I want her to love who she wants to. I want her to be with who she wants to be. Don't thank me yet. I still have to face the board and fight for the both of you. As promised, the chief defended us in front of the board, because as soon as the board meeting was over, he assured us that everything will be alright, despite the shouting Mark and I overheard. Mark and I were not allowed into the room, but we sat outside the conference room and eavesdropped. You cannot be letting these gay people infiltrate our operating room, Patrick, shouted Mr. Rivers, berating the chief. Mr. Rivers, they're excellent doctors. They're not the problem here, defended the chief. This is prejudice of some of the staff. It's their bitterness and jealousy. No, my decision is final. I will not let these filthy creatures cause any more scandals. Sooner or later, patients will complain. You really think they want gay doctors? I'm not running a hospital with gay surgeons. Get rid of them, Mr. Rivers yelled. Filthy creatures? Sir, those two gentlemen out there are saving lives every single day. Mark? He's a veteran. He's been here for as long as I could remember. And surgery after surgery, he is just showing how great of a surgeon he is. And Ariz Elliot? He may be new, but he's already showing his full potential. He will be a great surgeon, the chief implored. Patients never complain. In fact, they're thankful. They're thankful that they are treated by strong, competent surgeons. If you look past your prejudice and homophobia, you'll see how great surgeons they are. I heard approving sounds from the rest of the board, but Mr. Rivers was unrelenting. Fire them. It's unacceptable. No, another voice affirmed. I peered through the window and saw Mrs. Kelly standing up. You still need the rest of the board's votes and we say no. I let out a sigh of relief at the sound and I tuned out the rest of the board meeting, but I was surely thankful for the chief and how he stood up for us against a homophobic board member. As soon as the meeting came to a conclusion, the chief pulled us aside and assured that we would be just fine. You're okay. Rivers is a prejudiced little whiny man, but he was overpowered and the rest of the board is with you. After that day, we never heard gossip about ourselves. The chief, as promised, lectured the rest of the staff and berated Dr. Hudgens for his behavior. He was even suspended for a month, and that seemed to teach the rest of them a lesson. I was thankful for his help and happy that I was finally getting the support that I needed from my colleagues. Through it, my best friends, Sadie and Jasmine, supported me and extended that warmth to Mark. I once thought that the hospital love would be nothing but trouble, a distraction, an inappropriate affair, but it turned out to be so much more. My hazardous hospital love was not so bad after all. The end. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to become part of our Rainbow Force and stay wholesome. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to become a part of our Rainbow Force.
and stay wholesome.